Hello, everybody. Welcome into the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. My name is Ryan Warmly, and I am joined by Pat Fitzmorris and by Scott Bogman. I almost did the Dynasty show because that's what it usually is with the three of us. But we're on the main feed here today, boys. Fitz, how excited are you for this? Yeah, this is a novel treat. We get to talk some redraft with the Dynasty crew. It will be fun. We were able to pry Bogman away from the new college football game. How have you enjoyed it so far, Boggs? We talked a little bit before the show. Yeah, I mean, my thumb hurts and I'm rusty, uh, but uh, it's fun. You know, it, it's a fun experience playing the game like I was, you know, like I'm back in my 20s again. So uh, it's been fun. But yeah, now time to work now. Now time for serious stuff like fantasy football. So I, I was going to ask Fitz, what's your all time favorite video game? Is it like a Sega Genesis, like something from 30 years ago? It probably is. <laughs> Atari it's- Pong. Yeah, yeah exactly. Is that it? So I've always been a sports game guy and NHL 94 was a game changer when that came out. Like that was a classic. I, I've era never played one, but I've heard people talk about oh, that phenomenal. being like an all timer. Oh, my God. Is I- that the one in Swingers when uh, yes. like Vince Vaughn yes. unplugged John Favreau's uh, <laughs> thing and knocked over Wayne Gretzky and his yes. brains are everywhere? I, yeah, I yeah. Think I think I spent like, half of my waking hours in 1995 playing that video game. <laughs> I, I was never really been a big hockey guy. I love the backyard sports franchise. Though. Like backyard baseball 2001 is like the, the cream of the crop. But I you could play some of the other backyard sports ones. Backyard hockey was really fun, actually. I, I quite enjoy Not the same level as NHL 94, of course. But mm-hmm. um, that one was always super fun for me. Um, all right, let's dive into the show here. We are giving some first round draft advice. We're going to run through the top 12 players in ADP, where we think they should be ranked, where they are currently ranked, some potential risks for each of these guys. Um, Just a quick note for everybody that all of our 2024 consensus rankings and tiers can be found at fantasypros.com slash rankings. Also, a quick note for everyone, if you want a chance to win a signed Puka Nakua helmet for free, courtesy of our friends at pristineauction.com, all you need to do is head to fantasypros.com slash contest, complete the form, and either download the Fantasy Pros Draft Wizard app, leave a review for the podcast, or follow us on X slash Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok at Fantasy Pros and all three of those platforms. The more actions you complete, the more entries you'll receive. We'll be announcing a winner right here on the podcast. So if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe and turn on those notifications so you can be alerted when new episodes are up and to claim your prize. Guys, there's some drilling going on right outside my window. So hopefully, uh, you know, we can power They're fracking this the parking lot at Worms not, Place. Not yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, all right, let's jump right in here at the top. Uh, first round, right at the very top, it's Christian McCaffrey. He's going number one in ADP. We're going to get into some of the guys after him in a second. Fitz, I just want to start off. Is there any reason not to take Christian McCaffrey? Is there any single red flag you could point to outside of just the generic, like any running back can get hurt? Is there anything that you're shying away from or it's just the obvious one one? Yeah, I'm not sort of buying the Madden curse narrative that do you really want to take the guy uh, bet on the repeat when it so rarely happens like that is not my reason for avoiding Christian McCaffrey is the 101. Um, I, I don't really think there's a good reason like there used to be the injury prone narrative, but now he's stayed pretty healthy for two straight years. Um, he had what over 2,100 combined yards last year, 21 touchdowns, uh, add in the last, uh, the year where he had the half year with the 49ers. He still averaged about 1900 yards from scrimmage the last two years and had double digit touchdowns, both years prolific in both the rushing game and the passing game. I think he's the one-on-one same question, Bogman. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely, he's my one-on-one, and there's not a question. I will say that Pisa Pia put together a pretty good reasoning as to why not to take CMC at 101, and it was that he had over 400 touches combined between the regular season and the playoffs last year, and a lot of guys don't survive that. But there are certain circumstances and certain players that I just don't care. You know, like if he gets hurt, then fine. But I'm going to go down swinging and taking my chance at the best player in fantasy. And that is Christian McCaffrey. So there is there are reasons to not take him at one point one. And if you're a person that likes to avoid either running backs or just injury uh, at all, and you see this number and you just don't want to take CMC, I get it. But I can't take him off of number one. The upside is just too good. Interestingly, uh, you know, amongst the fantasy pro staff, Fitz is the only one who has CMC currently number one. Um, Joey P has him number two. 
Erickson and uh, Debro have them uh, a bit lower. They have them at fourth. Um, so they they both have uh, running back haters. Receivers higher. Yeah. So it is interesting in in the uh, overall consensus across the industry, not just the fantasy pros guys. He is number one in our expert consensus rankings. And then, like I said, the easy number one in ADP as well. So uh, kind of an obvious name. I just wanted to ask the question if there was any reason to look elsewhere to me. Don't overcomplicate it. Like if you have the first pick, just just take McCaffrey. And if somebody else overcomplicates it, rejoice and take McCaffrey second or third or however far he might crazily fall. But um, yeah, I think he's just kind of the clear choice. Um, so let's go on. Uh, number two is CD Lamb. Uh, we're going to get into more of a conversation with kind of this grouping of wide receivers. Um, but Bogman, is Lamb the right guy to be at the top of this group? And also, whoever's at the top of this group, if it is Lamb, is there a gap between that number one or are they all kind of pretty much clumped together? Um, I, I would have just like the slightest of gaps between Lamb and Hill and the other guys. Uh, but I do think Lamb is the next guy up, the highest target share outside of, I mean, I, actually Tyreek Hill, I think, let it in target share. But if you picked one wide receiver to lead the league in target share this year, it is absolutely going to be CeeDee Lamb because they have no run game. The other wide receivers, you know, it's an aging Brandon Cooks, it's Jake Ferguson, it's, you know, a coin flip as to who's going to be the, the third wide receiver there. So, I think CeeDee Lamb is going to be relied upon a bunch this year. I think that the targets are going to be heavy, and they were heavy last year. So uh, I just think more of the same from CD, and I want him as the number two pick. Fitz, is there any negative to CeeDee Lamb? He feels like the cleanest of these guys. Again, we're going to talk about you know Tyreek, Jamar Chase, maybe Justin Jefferson uh, as coming up as the next few picks. But Lamb feels like the one where there's just the fewest question marks. Is that an accurate representation, you think? I think so. Um, whereas Jamar Chase and Tyreek Hill have really, really good number two receivers uh, playing alongside them. Lamb only has Brandon Cooks, who had kind of a down year last year. Maybe he's sort of on the uh, finishing holes of his career. Um yeah, and I mean, like, we think Dallas is probably going to pass a lot because their running back group isn't especially good. And Lamb does pass every eye test. He's a phenomenal player. So I, I do think he, you know, is pretty much without warts as a prospect. And anyone can go, um, you know, anyone can get waylaid by injuries. But, like, that's the only concern. And Lamb's been pretty durable so far throughout his career. So is, is he number one for you then among this group? So, no. In a, in a vacuum, I have Tyreek Hill ranked as my wide receiver one. So over the last two years, Hill has averaged 18.1 half, uh, half point PPR fantasy points per game. Lamb just behind him, 17.2. Um, Tyreek, 7.2 catches a game, 106.3 yards. Lamb, 7.1 catches, 91.4 yards. They're basically neck and neck, both about uh, 0.61 TDs per game for Tyreek, 0.62 for Lamb. So really close. Tyreek has an edge there. I do think there's a potential that the Dolphins are going to be like in shootout mode all year because that defense has lost a lot. They lost Vic Fangio. They've lost a lot of their defensive stars. I think they're going to be playing a lot of 35-30 type games this year, but... I was in a draft recently where I had the 102. Christian McCaffrey went 101. I took Lamb over Tyreek, even though I have Tyreek ranked higher. The reason being, there are two other guys in the Dolphins who I really like, Devon A. Chan and Jalen Waddle. And I figured both of those guys were going to be in play for me at the 2 3 turn in that draft. So I went with Lamb instead. You know, I'm not really. I like Jake Ferguson, but otherwise, there aren't that many Dolphins or uh, Cowboys I'm interested in drafting. It's uh, maybe a little easier to stack Lamb with Dak Prescott because I don't know if Tua should be ranked as a QB1. He's kind of on the borderline there. Um, so I did take Lamb over Tyreek, but totally in a vacuum, like who I think is going to score the most fantasy points this year, I would take Tyreek. It's kind of funny because, you know, Lamb is the top ranked for you, Bogman, and then Tyreek is top ranked for you, Fitz. I think I might have Chase number one. That does line up with both Debra and Erickson, actually. They both have Chase as their number one player on draft words, uh, one of the players that they have ag- ahead of CMC. Um, I, I just feel like the ceiling is so high for Chase, and I am somewhat concerned about, you know, just the health stuff we have seen with Joe Burrow, it, you know, in recent years, and particularly the wrist thing is like, it's in the back of my mind, 
But at the end of the day, like when Burrow's in the field, elite quarterback, obviously, like as a passer. Um, and, they, and no mix in there either. So no, they may no mix pass in. a little bit more. I know if it's yeah. like Chase Brown, he will not be talked about in our first round today. But um, <laughs> not I, yet. I, and, I, and I know Higgins <laughs> is there, but Higgins has had his own injury stuff in the past. He's not always on the field. And like Chase just is such it's a clear alpha in my mind that I'm less worried about it. Um, I do agree with what you guys said about like Lamb and the question I posed is being sort of maybe the cleaner guy of the three. Um, but I just think the up the ceiling with Chase is so enormous. And it's in, it's high with all of these guys, to be fair. But I'm just really enamored with what I think could be a huge you know career year from Chase this season. So I think I probably have him first. Uh, but those three guys, I think it makes sense like kind of as those three. I want to ask on Justin Jefferson, the next kind of wide receiver down. Should he be in this tier with these three? Is it a tier of four or is he kind of down with the next group of guys as you get into the Amon Ra's and AJ Browns and the other guys we'll mention in this round? Fitz, what do you think? I'm dropping him down a tier just because the Vikings are in this transitional period at quarterback. Um, you know, it, mainly that's it. Like, I, I do worry about how it's going to work with the combination of Sam Darnold and J.J. McCarthy. McCarthy obviously has no NFL track record. Darnold, uh, rocky start to his career, although we did, we have seen D.J. Moore have some pretty good numbers with Sam Darnold. Um, so, like, Jefferson is just too talented to completely disappear, but he does maybe have some obstacles that these other guys don't have. Yeah, Bogman, I mean, Jefferson is just, so so good like it's it's the obstacles are clear like from what Fitz is laying out but at the same time it's like you're telling me I can get pr maybe the best receiver in football with the fifth or sixth pick this year like that feels awesome right yeah and look uh you know we're picking nits here uh, and we we are and but that's what you're supposed to do in the first round if you're talking about the first round you're breaking it down you are supposed to pick at things so I understand Fitz's reluctance to have Jefferson in that group uh, I think he's quarterback proof, though. We saw him succeed with, you know, it was Dobbs and Mullins down the stretch. And not only him, but we saw Kevin O'Connell still pass the ball. They had, you know, I, it was week 10, right, when Kirk Cousins got hurt. So seven more games, almost half the season, and they still passed the fourth most times in the NFL. The defense has a lot to do with that. But you can't tell me the defense got any better this offseason, not letting uh, Hunter go. So uh, I and they blitz a lot, too. So I think they're going to be playing point for point with a lot of teams. And I don't think Kevin O'Connell is going to take the foot off the gas in terms of the amount of passes he has. So I think I actually have all five of these guys kind of in a group. I think I have a Monra firmly at five. So if you wanted to split him off uh, just for track record of the other guys, I'm fine with that. But I think the top five guys are all really good. And I don't think you're making a mistake by taking any of them. Yeah, to me, Amonra is a tier of his own. It's to me like there's no chance I'm taking him over the other four guys. But there's no yeah. chance that I'm taking one of the like the AJ Brown or Puka ahead of him. Like I think Amonra is very clearly for me wide receiver five. That's very like, fair. Put yeah. put it in in stone for me. He fits you know with with Jefferson if. Let's say like Jordan Addison, you know, obviously has this DUI stuff. Let's say there's missed time. Does that change your calculus at all? Or is the kind of cons the, the red flag of just we don't really know what J.J. McCarthy is or we've seen what Sam Darnold is. Is that oh, more overwhelming than like the possibility of like there is a talented number two guy there when he's on the field? For the record, I don't think Addison would face any sort of suspension this year. I think it would be more likely next year. But if he were to get, you know, two to four games, um, I don't know if that would be enough to really move the needle. So I've I've got him behind two of the running backs in the first round. Jefferson, I, I don't know if I would vault him past the running backs with an Addison suspension. But, I mean, you were just talking about Jefferson versus Amon Ra. And I think for a lot of people, like I, I know some sharp people who do rankings, I've seen them uh, put Amon Ra ahead. And I, I do get it. I personally have Jefferson ranked higher. Just because I think he's the better player, and and you know to Boggs's point, maybe he is indeed quarterback proof. But man, Amon Ra, I had him in a guillotine league last year. He is the best guillotine league player of all time because he does not have off weeks. Like a, a bad week for Amon Ra St. Brown is five catches for sixty two yards, and that's still like eleven point two PPR points. Like he just shows up week after week after week. 
And uh, like that sort of dependability is is worth a lot. And I understand why that would be appealing to people in the first round. It's like the old Southwest commercial where they're like a bad day in Florida beats a good day anywhere else. Like a bad day for a Monra beats a good day for a whole lot of other receivers. Uh, I think it's a, a great point. Uh, you know, the beautiful thing about being a sports fan, there's only like two days the whole year without a game, just two with so much happening and so much action that makes just about every day game day at DraftKings Sportsbook. It's super easy for first timers to get started. Try betting on something simple like picking a team to win. Go to the DraftKings Sportsbook app, select your team and place your first bet it really couldn't be any easier or any simpler baseball golf ufc there's something for every fan of every sport to bet on at DraftKings. and i know it's early but football season is just around the corner we are nearly nearly there uh so it is uh we're training camps are really basically already opening up so we're basically there it's not even uh, early anymore if you're new to DraftKings, you got to check this out new customers bet five dollars Get $150 in bonus bets instantly. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code FANTASYPROS. That's code FANTASYPROS for new customers to get $150 in bonus bets instantly when you bet just $5 only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. All right, guys. So the next two in ADP, and so far as a reminder, Christian McCaffrey 1, CD Lamb 2, Tyree Kill 3, Jamar Chase 4, Justin Jefferson 5. The next two is Bijan Robinson and Brees Hall. I want to parse between these two in a moment. Before we do that, for either of them, regardless of the order you have them, are you guys taking any of them ahead of any of these receivers we've already talked about? Fitz, you've already mentioned having Jefferson behind these guys. Is there anybody else that you would take these running backs over, or are they kind of firmly in that 5-6 range for you? 5-6 uh, for me, yes. 4-5 okay. for me. Okay. Four or five for me. I, I just one spot up. I put them ahead of behind. Like I, I said before, I have it kind of, you know, Lamb and Hill kind of by themselves. And then Chase Jefferson Brown, you can put them in a tier however you like them. But I have Hall and, and Robinson ahead of those guys. I, I feel like there is something of a pretty set top eight ish that does line up with what we have as our tiers in uh, in ECR. So, you know, that gets into Bijan and, and Brees the guys we've talked about already, and then Amon Ra, obviously, um, who, who's going to come up later in ADP. I think that's kind of the clear top eight in my mind, and then there's a bit of a gap there. Um, this is one of the more interesting debates, I think, of the fantasy season. Uh, Yahoo, I saw um, Dalton Del Don and Andy Barron's just had an interesting article where they kind of each picked a side on Bijan versus Brees and who they were going to have as RB2. I asked this of Andrew Erickson on our TikTok Live yesterday, which everybody should check out every Tuesday. And he said that he actually has one of these guys as RB1 and the other as RB2 and Chris McCaffrey down at RB3. So he's he's you know going out on a bit of a limb there. We already talked about that a bit. But either way, these two head to head, like I love them both. You, If I wake up tomorrow, I might have a different answer. Today, I might feel one way. I think it's really difficult. Bogman, how are you parsing between these two? People are going to be shocked. For this season, I have Brees one spot. That is shocking. I thought I was teeing and, you up. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, I understand it, too. And look, again, we're picking nits. We're splitting hairs. Whatever verbiage you want to use, right? We are trying to find a slight difference between these very good players. And to me, the slight difference is you have – Two options, really, in New York. It's Garrett Wilson. It's Brees Hall. Brees is going to have an insane amount of work. Braylon Allen is his number two. Cut maybe earmuffs for this uh, fits, but I don't think Braylon Allen is going to get many touches this season. Like, not behind Brees Hall. You know what I mean? Like, they're, they keep the guy on the field because he's the best guy. Bijan is amazing. They've talked about using him like Christian McCaffrey. I, I think he's... Talent-wise, right up there with Christian McCaffrey in terms of how he's going to be used. We've had so many empty promises with Bijan from last season. And also, Tyler Algier is a very good back behind him. And they have Pitts, and they have London. I also don't know what's going to go on with that quarterback scenario. Yes, the Jets have their own quarterback issues as well, but they both have them. I don't know. I just think for reliability and the crazy workload two years removed from the injury now i think it's going to be all gas no breaks for Brees hall i think he's going to get so many touches and so many opportunities to score i have him one spot ahead of my boy Bijan. 
One of the fun parts about both these guys is that, like, if you imagine a touchdown happening for the Falcons offense or for the Jets offense, there's not that many other options that you're going to think of it could go to. Like, if it happens for the Jets, it's, like, pretty much going to be Garrett Wilson or or Brees Hall. Most times, you, we would imagine. And similar in Atlanta, like, it's going to be Drake London, maybe Kyle you're not Pitts. Closing but your eyes, really... seen a lot of Tyler Conklin touchdowns, just, you know. I, some, but, you know, not ahead of <laughs> Brees, right? I mean, like, right. you you would imagine – now that Arthur Smith is gone, that it's not going to be going to, you know, these weird backup tight ends and stuff. It's going to be these, these, you know, kind of main players. So, and we saw what this, you know, Rams offense, which is now the folks in Atlanta did with Kyron Williams last year. And and we're very happy to have like that workhorse guy. So, I mean, there's just, there's so many arrows pointing up for both of these players that again, that's what makes it difficult. Fitz, how are you right. kind of picking between them? Yeah. So I do have Bijan just a smidge higher and it is really splitting hairs. Like, I mean, it's neck and neck. I, I, just took Brees Hall with my first round pick in the Scott Fishball when B. John Robinson wasn't an option and was delighted getting Brees. Um, I, I think the Falcons offensive line projects to be a little bit better. I don't know that it's necessarily a lot more talented. The Jets have certainly addressed that area, but I do wonder if it will take the Jets a while to consolidate some of the new offensive line talent, sort of like it did with the Bengals a couple of years ago when they brought in a lot of new people to upgrade that unit and uh, it didn't really mesh right away. So I think the Falcons have the better line. And, um, you know, like I'm taking the leap of faith with Zach Robinson that he is going to, um, you know, be a, a more logical play caller, less of a vanity play caller than Arthur Smith was. And and knowing that Bijan Robinson putting it the ball in his hands is a better idea than running a reverse to Scotty Miller or Kaderil Hodge. So um, better, he better step right over that bar. That is the lowest bar. You <laughs> can that is a low he bar indeed. Step over. Um, so, you know, and, and Zach Robinson does come from the Rams coaching tree. And Sean McVay has generally been a one running back kind of guy, like use one guy pretty heavily, uh, have someone in reserve. But like he has not been a committee guy and maybe Zach Robinson is of the same mind. So, um, and the other thing, I mean, Brees Hall with a, a torn ACL, like should be fully over it, but he's at a torn ACL. So, um, I don't know. It really is splitting. You, Sorry. No, I, I was just going to say, what do you think about Erickson? Uh, Cause we're talking, we're building these guys up so much. What do you think about Erickson's stance that they both could finish ahead of Christian McCaffrey this year? I mean, is that it's going out on a limb to a degree because CMC is a consensus number one, but, to what degree is that even a bold prediction versus like you could see it happening, Fitz? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think if they all stay healthy, I, I would be pretty confident that CMC outscores the other two guys. I mean, like he gets the ball a lot. You know, um, Kyle Shanahan works him pretty hard. He, I mean, they all catch a lot of passes. That's great. But I, I do think maybe Shanahan is a little more I don't know. I don't want to say that he's more committed to the run than some of these other play callers, but we know Shanahan likes to run the ball. So uh, the CMC ran into the most stacked boxes in the NFL yeah. last year, thirty six percent. So it's not easy carries either. So it's fear, and it's understandable fear that CMC gets hurt. Um, but it is fear. I think that is what I think that's what pushes him down boards uh, because he had four hundred touches last year. He faces the stack boxes all the time. Shanahan's not taking him off. Shanahan has told us three years in a row or two years in a row he's going to take CMC off the field in more situations, and he doesn't. So I think I think it's mainly based in thinking that CMC will end up getting hurt because he's touched the ball so much. And, and by the way, I'm not worried about Brees Hall's workload in any way, shape, or form either, especially after the Jets like ran him into the ground late last season yeah, when they yeah. were clearly going nowhere and still gave him – like. It was kind of dumb, to be quite honest, the way they were working. A lot of dump off passes to him, yeah. too, when things wouldn't work in the pass game. So he's just so many touches. Yeah. The, the more I like talk about these guys and, and think about it, I, I almost just would have them like fourth and fifth, at least like maybe even like like I'm taking CMC ahead of them. I'm probably taking both. Chase and Lamb, like I might even like them ahead of Tyreek, just another year older, got a little dinged up last year, relies so much on the speed we've talked about on the show before. There's other options in Miami. Like I just really love both Bijan and Brees. And I I don't know what I'm going to do if I'm on the clock and my receivers of choice are gone. 
and and I, and it's both of them and I have to pick between them. Like I genuinely don't know how I will feel in the moment, you know, come come August. But right now, just like give me either of them, sign me up, and I'm I'm a happy guy. Yeah. I, you grab your lucky coin, you yeah. flip it, and you you land on one of them, and then uh, you keep that coin if it went to a league, and if not, you burn it. So there you I, go. I think what I do is I insist all my leagues are salary cap formats this year, and I just get both of them because <laughs> yeah, I right. I want both of them on as many rosters as possible. Um, so that's six and seven in ADP right now. Eight is Amon Ross St. Brown, who I already talked about a bit. Are there any red flags with him, Fitz? Or is it, I mean, again, we talked about how the floor is so high, um, you know, when we were comparing him to, to Jefferson. Like, you know, they have they brought the offensive coordinator back, and Jared Goff seemingly is taking a step forward. Like, it just... I mean, again, it's similar to Lamb. It's just clean, and, and it feels like the floor is really, really solid. And he also really fits uh, the way Jared Goff likes to play, I think. I don't think Jared Goff is super aggressive about taking shots downfield. And so um, for that reason, I'm not especially worried about Jamison Williams like making any sort of significant dent in Amon Ra's target share. I mean, J- Jamison could take a step up this year, but like, what's he going to steal? Maybe like, six, seven extra targets that would otherwise go to Amon Ra. Like, I just can't see him having any sort of major bearing on that. More likely, it's just a redistribution of targets to outside receivers with Jamison basically leaving guys like Khalif Raymond and Donovan Peoples-Jones in the dust. Anything to that, to Fitz's point, Bogman, about like Jared Goff maybe preferring kind of the underneath stuff? Like, if there's another step forward from Sam Laporta, could that eat into Amon Ra at all? I, I think I think it's insane that uh, Laporta was so good last season. Uh, this whole offense supported David Montgomery and Jameer Gibbs and Amonra St. Brown. And now, you know, we're hearing Dan Campbell, who I think I, I read a tweet. I, I should be writing these down. But I saw a tweet that said, like, Dan Campbell is the – like what he says in his press conferences comes true more than other coaches. He does not BS. He's he's a straight shooter. Like and the coach said, speak index. Yeah, the uh, coach yeah. speak index. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that yeah. that was it. Uh, what I saw, but it was like, uh, you know, and he said Jamison Williams is the guy that took the biggest step up this season, and it's going to be a bigger factor. So I kind of believe Campbell when he says that. So if we are splitting hairs, we're finding things to not like about these guys to push one guy up or one guy down, it would be that this offense is full, and it has a lot of pieces to support. And But to Fitz's point, last year he was the ultimate guillotine guy because he got his 10 targets and his 8 catches and his 70 yards and maybe a score every single game it seemed like. So... Uh, he's just so unbelievably reliable that I have no issue or fear in taking him. Remember when you first started playing fantasy football? It was fun, right? Now your draft can feel like you're studying for a math test. And as somebody who used to draft primarily on vibes, I sometimes find it tricky to keep up with all the latest metrics, and I miss the fun. This year, reclaim that same enjoyment with the Draft Assistant. Draft Assistant simplifies the entire draft process, making it the easy way to dominate your fantasy draft. It connects to your draft, keeps track of everything that's going on, and tells you who the best best pick is when you're on the clock. All you have to focus on is the excitement of making the perfect pick. So this season, work less and win more with Draft Assistant. Learn more at fantasypros.com slash assistant or download our Fantasy Football Draft Wizard app. All right, guys, there's a cluster of wide receivers here at the back half, back third, really, of the first round that I want to loop together. At number nine in ADP, it's A.J. Brown. At number 10, it's Puka Nakua. And at number 11, it's Garrett Wilson. There are really interesting cases to be made for any of these guys and against them. I think personally, at least, um, I know you know they all kind of have their favorites, right? Like uh, Erickson has been a big Garrett Wilson guy. Debro, obviously a big Puka Nakua guy. A.J. Brown, we know the talent. Of these three, Brown, Nakua, and Wilson, Fitz, what are you doing with them? I have them all in a row, and I have it A.J. Brown, Garrett Wilson, Puka Nakua. And I recently, I recently moved Wilson ahead of Puka because Garrett Wilson is going to get a huge target share regardless, and I'm not quite sure how the target distribution is going to work with Puka and Cooper Cup if Cooper Cup stays healthy all season. And I certainly have my doubts that he can stay healthy all season, um, after you know some of the recent injury problems he's had, but uh, like Cooper Cup is going to get quite a few targets if he is on the field. Like Puka is the genie that's not going back in the bottle. He's just too good not to stay very relevant in this offense and get a lot of targets himself. But 
I mean, Garrett Wilson's ceiling might be higher than we have even really discussed. Like this guy's so good. And the fact that he has been able to be like what last year, an 1100 yard receiver with the quarterbacking the Jets were getting, which was just beyond horrible, like Canadian football league level quarterbacking. Um, yeah, there might be, and really who's going to steal targets from Garrett Wilson, like Mike Williams, if, if he can stay healthy, like he's a good receiver, but he's also sort of a, a shot play specialist, a, a deep artist, clear out guy, uh, Tyler Conklin, like the makings are there for Garrett Wilson to like, you know, have a, a something like a 27, 28% target share here. And like if, if Aaron Rodgers doesn't stay healthy all year, they've actually got a decent option behind him now with Tyrod Taylor. So um, maybe we're sleeping on Garrett Wilson a little bit. AJ Brown, I've, I've thought about moving him down. I am a little worried about the hit that J- Jalen Hurts had in passing efficiency last year without Shane Steichen. But I don't know. Brown is just so physically imposing that combination of size and speed. And he's just been so good. Like I, I haven't been able to drop him. I, I do feel like with Brown, it's a little bit the scenario of like, he's been good for so long that we just like, you know what he is. And it's the, you know, shiny new toy syndrome. It's the excitement of like, wow, year two for Puka after historic rookie season or wow, Garrett Wilson, so talented, finally getting a, you know, a healthy Aaron Rodgers. Like it's, it's very easy to talk yourself into what that ceiling could be. And I do think like of these three, Garrett Wilson is the one, if I had to bet on one of them being in that, lamb chase jefferson tier this time next year wilson seems like the obvious pick to me i don't know do you disagree with that bogman um maybe uh maybe marvin harrison i would put i meant just just of these three guys of those three guys yeah Yeah. i would probably i would probably say him then yeah yeah garrett well I'm, i'm still a huge aj brown fan i mean i know that he wasn't great down the stretch uh and jalen wasn't great down the stretch but this guy made Ryan Tannehill a pro bowler, right? Like, I mean, I if there's something that says quarterback proof to me, it's Ryan Tannehill was a pro bowler. Now, offense collapse proof, I don't think any player is, right? So uh, outside of maybe Christian McCaffrey. Uh, but, uh, you know, I just think, I think we're overlooking, I think we're knocking A.J. Brown a little bit too much. Let's not forget he put up a career high in receptions last year, 106. So you're, if you're playing in a PPR league, this is a guy that's going to get 100 catches. He's had 1,400 yards two years in a row. It's the touchdowns that you want uh, that that we're missing in the second half. I think he averaged like 0.2 from week 9 to 17. So that's not great. You want to see him get in the end zone. But he's he's a give-me-the-damn-ball receiver. He is a whiner, uh, but he is going to get the ball because he's so good. And I have no doubts about that. So for me, AJ Brown is firmly in this group. I don't have the other two in my first round. Okay. I, I wanted to ask you, Bogman, about Puka, because I, I think Fitz, you know, I think he's right when he says that, like, he was just too good last year. Like, we're not, he's not going to disappear, right? Obviously. But there is like, okay, he didn't have this degree, you know, the the pedigree uh, with the draft capital. And sometimes you see regression in those scenarios. Also, he got hurt in college and, you know, was very, you know, good this last year about staying on the field, but he got hurt in college. So that is in part of his background. And like, we don't exactly know what the distribution of, you know, the the targets is going to be in this offense, like with Cooper Cup, theoretically on on the field the entire season. There's like just enough not even red flags, but just like question marks to me that I I would, I would have him behind Brown and Wilson, like not by a lot, but definitively. I have, I have him still ahead of Wilson. Uh, but I mean, I have those three guys. I have Wilson, Marvin Harrison and Puka kind of in a group. So uh, to me, they're all kind of in this same area on the first, second round borderline, somewhere in that neighborhood. I'm not letting him fall past the middle of the second. I can tell you that for any of them. But for Puka, you're right. I mean, it is, it's about repeatability, right? You had the most, you had the most impressive rookie season of any wide receiver in the history of the game. Are you going to repeat those numbers? Is this what we're going to expect? Is there regression? And can he face this gauntlet of games again? He did it one year and passed the test. He didn't do it in college a bunch. So is this a thing that's going to affect him down the line? I think there are just a couple more questions about Puka. It's not questions in the talent, 
We saw it there. And sometimes, you know, every player coming in the NFL is raw a little bit. As complete as they are, they're still learning things. So it might just be the case where Puka Nakua got with a coach, learned something, and now he's one of the best wide receivers in the NFL. And he's going to be there as a perennial star. I just, we have to know that. And we don't. We're, we're, we think it is because he was so impressive his first season, but we're not 100% sure. So that for that reason is why I have him just a little bit lower than ECR. I hate him. I got him at 14. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, he still was very impressive as a very, very good receiver. But there are, with Cup, repeatability, you know, there there are questions for Puka for sure. Fitz, what do you think about what Bogman said about having Marvin Harrison Jr. kind of in that same grouping with like Puka and Garrett Wilson, um, you know, kind of back to back to back as you get into the early second round as opposed to these guys kind of separated up in the first? I mean, I do think Harrison's going to get there eventually and maybe he will be there right from the start. And, um, you know, like everyone is hesitant to take the rookies because they haven't done it yet in the NFL. And so you get these discounts on guys. And yet Marvin Harrison is maybe the least discounted of the high drafted wide receivers that we've seen in the last few decades. I mean, guys like Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, uh, Jalen Waddell, guys who were really highly regarded early draft picks. Well, Jefferson wasn't that early. He actually went behind Jalen Rager famously. But um, <laughs> like these guys... I don't know. People are hesitant to pull the trigger on them. Kind of the same thing with Malik Neighbors this year and Romo Dunze. But with them, it's understandable. Like Neighbors doesn't have the quarterback situation. We find I think it's the Ohio State guys, Fitzy. Do you think that has something? Because Olave and Wilson stepped in and were both awesome. And if you put Harrison in with that group, Harrison's the best of them. Is he not? And J, I mean, JSN is the only one of that group that wasn't a pro bowler immediately. And that's because DK Metcalf was a pro bowler. Yes, the, so. the Brian Hartline wide receiver factory out of Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. yeah, so that is a factor. And I mean, like, I don't think anyone's going to give pause that Jackson Smith and Jigba didn't fire right away. But um, yeah, like, I, I do think Marvin Harrison Jr. is very legit and will be talked about as a first rounder next year, I suspect. So maybe we should beat the the everyone in the punch and have him as a first rounder this year. I don't know. I've got him as a an early second round value, so I'm not too far off. I th I think to your point, Fitz. Like I would rather take Malik Neighbors in like the middle of the fourth than I would Marvin Harrison in the at the top of the second. Like I think that's a yes. better value. But yes. I'm happy to do both. Like yes. I think Harrison <laughs> still belongs in the top half of the second. We've talked before this off season about how there's kind of a clear like top sixteen or seventeen, and I think Harrison is firmly in that. Like I I think yeah. he very much belongs. I'm at fifteen. Group. Yeah, I, I think absolutely he he belongs in that range. So uh, Fitz is not going to be happy with the last guy. Um, so we've gone through 11, the first 11 in ADP. Number 12 is Jameer Gibbs. It's not Jonathan Taylor, who is number 13. In ECR, it's reversed. In our expert consensus rankings, Taylor is 12, Gibbs is 13. But in ADP, which you can also find on the site, Gibbs is 12 and Taylor is 13. So obviously there's like some disagreement here between ADP and ECR. Fitz, you obviously think that John, and you you said this in our pre-show when we were planning. <laughs> it was the first thing you said was get ready for me to talk about Jonathan Taylor. Yeah, so I've actually got Taylor ninth overall. I have him. Same. Oh, do you? Same. Nice. Yeah, no. I, I have him directly ahead of that wide receiver tier we just talked about with AJ Brown, Puka Nakua, Garrett Wilson. And I've got Jameer Gibbs 13th overall. So it's not like I think he's a terrible reach as being the 12 overall here. That's just one spot higher than I have him. The thing with Gibbs is that from the time David Montgomery returned from a rib injury last year at about midseason, week 10, through the end of the season, including the playoffs, that was 11 games from week 10 through the playoffs, Gibbs averaged exactly 11 carries a game and 2.9 catches a game. So you're talking about a guy who once the usage normalized with him playing together with David Montgomery was averaging under 14 touches a game. 13.9 a game. That's not a lot of touches for running back you're drafting in the first round. And yes, he is really freaky good. No question about the talent level. But like some people are balking at taking Devon Achan on the round two, round three turn when his workload projects to be really similar to Jameer Gibbs. And oh, by the way, Devon Achan also really, really talented. Um, so I, I just think 
maybe the first round is a little too early for Gibbs. Whereas Taylor, if he's healthy, is probably going to be getting somewhere from 16 to 20 touches a game. Like he is going to get a lot of work. And I know he's probably not going to give you a lot in the passing game, whereas Gibbs is a really dynamic pass catcher. Um, but man, like Taylor, with the rushing attempts he gets, a, a legitimate chance to lead the NFL in carries this year. And he's probably going to be hyper efficient with Anthony Richardson as the quarterback because we've seen what mobile quarterbacks can do to the efficiency of their running backs. They drive it through the roof. So, like, I think Taylor could have a massive, massive rushing season this year. And we also saw when Richardson was hurt that, like, Shane Steichen, like, definitely has the juice. He, he's he got it. And, like, we'll keep the offense, you know, humming very well, I think. You know, even if Richardson, if you are worried about the injury or for whatever reason affecting this offense, like I think Jonathan Taylor will still be really good, even if Richardson is out. But the sky is the limit when, you know, when they're both in the field together. Uh, I, I'm with you guys, by the way, like after that kind of clear top eights off the board, I don't think there's a build I like better if I'm not in that top eight of like Jonathan Taylor in the back third of the first round and like Harrison early in the second. I'm going to be thrilled with that if I walk away with that in a lot of leagues. And like, like we to our point. Both of them are outside the top 12 in ADP currently. Uh, Bogman, you said you agree. You have Taylor nine. How far ahead of that is uh, if C then Gibbs for you? I have Gibbs at, um, let me just double check, I think 11. Yeah, I have, uh, no, I have, yeah, Gibbs at 11. I have Barkley at 12. And the the thing with, with JT is that, sure, we can be worried about this high ankle sprain. His last game of the season, he had 30 carries. So, you know, and that was coming off the injury. So with a full off season and everything, I'm just not worried about health issues with JT at this point. We saw him get a massive workload at the end of the season and be fine coming off of it. So they can baby him because he was hurt going into last year. All they want in the preseason, I'm sure they will. That'll be added rhetoric to why people don't want to take this running back. I completely understand it. But uh, for me, it's just the upside is insane. This is a guy that can take 30 carries a game and be okay. So uh, it's not something you want for the whole season, but he's the first guy that you expect to score a touchdown in Indy is JT. I don't think they're going to want to run Anthony Richardson, who broke his collarbone in the fourth game last season or second game or whatever it was, um, you know, taking that many shots near the goal line. Give it to your back. And I, he's going to have a bunch of touchdowns, which I think gives him more upside than a couple of those other backs. And I will say this about Jameer Gibbs, though, Fitz. You, you did mention his touches, but weeks one through nine last season, half PPR, Montgomery was seventh in points per game at 16.4. Gibbs was still an RB1 at 13.7 points per game. And then weeks nine through 17, Gibbs was fifth in scoring, even with that few amount of touches, 15.6. Montgomery uh, was 13, 13.4. So, and Gibbs is going as the fifth running back right now. I think he's perfectly in that range. And again, Dan Campbell, the promiser, who we believe for the most part, um, has said that Gibbs is going to be more involved in the offense this year. So I, I just, I think it's wheels up for Gibbs. I think he's uh, hitting his prime right now. Yeah, I mean, the, the reason I use that cutoff point though, Boggs, because some of those games in the first nine, Montgomery missed. And we know that the games Montgomery missed, Gibbs went berserk. And like, sure. that that's ideally what we would want with him being the clear lead back. But we know that's not going to be the case if Monty is playing. And by the way, Worm, you started to hint at it when you were talking about early last year with Richardson playing. Got to say the name, man, Zach Moss, who was putting up the kind of uh, numbers for a Colts running back, while not dissimilar to what Jonathan Taylor was doing in 2021 or uh, what Edger and James used to do back in the day. Like Zach Moss was going nuts early last year playing with Anthony Richardson and Jonathan Taylor is 10 times the player Zach Moss is. I, I really think Jonathan Taylor is closer to the Bijan and Brees conversation than he Same. is to the rest of the running backs. Yep. Same. I, I, I do not understand why he's not in the first round in ADP. He's to me like the we're going to talk about some other players that we think could maybe be considered omissions from this first round. He's the biggest one by a mile. Like it's not just Fitz being, you know, Wisconsin Homer. Like he absolutely he belongs there. And like he doesn't belong at 12. He belongs higher than that. I if I, any draft where I'm picking again in this kind of back third. I will be aiming to come away with Jonathan Taylor. Uh, I mean, like two years ago, he was like the consensus number one pick and he's only 25. It's not like two years ago was when he was 25. Now he's getting older. He was, he's only 25 now. Like I just, 
I'm Preach. really, really excited about him this year. I don't, again, health permitting, which is true of everybody in football. Like, I don't see any way he doesn't, he's not a top 12 player in, in fantasy football this year. I just don't see how it's possible if everybody stays on the field. Um, so we are in consensus that he belongs in the first round. Um, is there anybody else that we think maybe belongs there? I mean, we talked a bit about Marvin Harrison Jr. as like, we, we, we all kind of think he's going to be there next year. So maybe he should be there this year. I mean, he's walking into as ideal a situation as you can possibly walk into. We've talked about it before, but I mean, he's got Trey McBride there so that he's not the only name, you know, game in town, but there's not all these other receivers that are going to challenge for targets. He's going to be the top target earner in Arizona this year. He's playing with a now another year removed from the ACL issue. Kyler Murray, who is a pretty good quarterback like I, I am really excited about Marvin Harrison Jr. this year. I don't know if there's one of these names I would knock out for him, but I'm with you guys that if I'm betting on somebody in the second round to be a first rounder a year from now, he is like as as good as any. And then you kind of mentioned uh, Saquon Bogman, and I know that's something that you guys have disagreed on in the past. I'm starting to come around on Saquon as as an early second round pick. That that if I'm getting a wide receiver in the first round, I'm starting to like Sa- Saquon quite a bit. Um, do you want to dive in a little deeper about why you brought him up? Yeah, I mean, the reason why I brought him up is because it's not necessarily you don't have to love Saquon the player to like his fit in Philly. That's really the thing for me that pushes him up because I think he is slowing down a little bit. This is his you know, big contract, all that stuff with the Eagles. But DeAndre Swift had 230 touches and a thousand yards uh, just running the ball last season. And we know that, um, you know, Saquon is just so much exponentially better than uh, DeAndre Swift. What is he going to do behind this line? Let's even knock the line a little bit since Kelsey is gone. And But how much better of an RB is Saquon than DeAndre Swift? I just think he's so much better. I think this offense is going to explode this year. I think we're all kind of down on what Jalen Hurts did. I think Jalen Hurts working with Saquon is the same kind of lift that we get with Derrick Henry going to Baltimore, which by the way, I have Derrick Henry at 13. So I'm in on both these guys going to new spots. They're older running backs, yes, but they're in great spots for running backs. So I think they're both on that borderline. And I I think I'm splitting hairs, taking Saquon over Henry. You could go Henry over Saquon, whatever way you like. I just think the workload is massive for two run first teams. What do you think about Saquon Fitz as maybe like an option at that like end of round one turn? I think I have him valued somewhere in the second round in terms of overall rankings, but I'm not close to considering him as a first rounder. I just, it wouldn't surprise me if Saquon had the best rushing season of his career with this much improved offensive line. Um, It major upgrade to Saquon's ecosystem without question, but just as I've sort of warned that maybe uh, Jalen Hurts' streak of double-digit rushing touchdowns might be in jeopardy, I also think the presence of Hurts sort of limits the touchdown upside for Saquon. Like, I I could see a scenario where both have about eight touchdown runs this year, or, or nine each. But, like, I don't think there's, like, 15 touchdown uh, run upside for either guy. The other thing is, like, what we were excited about when Saquon came into the league is that he had that Marshall Falk potential as a rusher receiver. Like, he could give us that dual usage. We have not seen him be, like, really effective in the passing game as a receiver since about 2019. That Like, that's just a fact. He's been inefficient, not particularly um, prolific with his receiving numbers, and I don't think it's going to happen in Philly where – Jalen Hurts really hasn't thrown to his backs all that much. And uh, that's just kind of not the way the Eagles play. So I think he might have a big year on the ground, but I I don't think he's going to add all that much as a pass catcher. And I do worry about what his touchdown ceiling might look like. I think we've mentioned everybody already that has a realistic chance of going in the top 12 in drafts. Is there anybody else that you guys think we haven't hit on that should at least, you know, warrant consideration like Devonte Adams is ADP is higher than Marvin Harrison Jr. You know, there are people who are pretty excited about Chris Olave, Drake London, kind of as you get into those wide receivers in the second round. I mean, you mentioned Derrick Henry Bogman and like, I don't think I have the courage to draft a 30 year old running back in the first round, but I sure think he's going to finish, you know, something in that top 12 he's or 15. He's a freak. 
in in fantasy points is because like, I mean, what what drives fantasy scoring? It's touchdowns. He's going to score if he's healthy. He's going to score like 15 touchdowns this year. So like, I don't hate that ranking at all. And of course, you can get him later than 13, which is nice. But yeah, are there any other names that you think fits warrant consideration here? Yeah, I mean, I don't know about consideration, but it wouldn't be surprising to me if Isaiah Pacheco wound up as one of the top scorers in fantasy football this year. If things break right, like if he stays healthy, which could be a challenge with his, uh, you know, let's say aggressive running style, um, there's no one who's going to challenge him for primacy in the Kansas City backfield. And that offense should be a whole lot better this year with the juice they're getting at wide receiver from uh, Hollywood Brown and, and Xavier Worthy. So I could see a, a 15 touchdown season for Pacheco if things break right and he plays all 17 games. Um, but like, am I actually considering drafting him in the first round? No. Uh, anybody for you, Bogman? I know Jalen Waddle is somebody that Erickson likes. We've talked about before. Anybody else for you? I'm actually down on Waddle. Uh, no, for me, the last guy to consider would maybe be Kyron. And I know a lot of people are down on Kyron because Blake Corn's coming in. And, you know, Kyron faced a ridiculous 4.86% of stack boxes. I just told you, you know, CMC was over 36%. But not a lot is changing in LA. It's still Stafford, it's Puka, and it's a healthy cup. So I think defenses are going to respect the pass game still. We're going to have a lot of those same lanes open for Kyron. It's about fending off Blake Corum or, you know, still earning that massive amount of touches and touchdown repeatability. No one thinks it's going to be the same. I don't even think it's going to be the same. But the dude averaged, you know, well over 20 points a game last season. So I, I think that, you know, if he was healthy, he could be considered here. But I have him in the middle of the second. That's the only guy I could like squint and see vaulting himself. Uh, up yeah, into Ky the first round. Ky Kyron is an interesting one because he basically was at that elite level when on the field last year. Yeah, there's a lot of reasons to think it won't be repeatable, but he's an interesting one. Let me throw one more at you guys. And you can kind of imagine in your own heads whatever the best case landing spot is. If Brandon Ayuk goes to whatever you consider to be the best case landing spot for him, where he becomes more of a target alpha, where he is still this elite route runner, and we, we all believe in the town as a player, and again, that team could be, I, I'm not even sure who that team is, but if you can imagine a team like that and he gets, does he actually get traded, which he has officially requested at this point, I don't know that it'll happen. Could he be somebody that could be worth it in that range if he goes to the right spot, Fitz? I don't think so. Um, okay. He's really good and, and we do want to see an increase in his, by demanding a trade, Brandon Ayuk is basically telling you that he's overvalued in fantasy right now because he is being <laughs> drafted like really early as a, a back end wide receiver one when he only had 105 targets last year, which is kind of crazy. So I'm, I'm trying to think of the best possible spots, like maybe if they traded him to Washington and got back Terry McLaurin in the deal, which, you know, if there actually were to be an IU trade, maybe the 49ers would have to demand a, a wide receiver in return since, you know, the draft has come and gone. It's too late for them. They did draft Ricky Pearsall, but I don't think Pearsall is ready to move into the starting lineup yet. Not He might start the year on the pup, what what I read yesterday. Yeah, so not, not sure if they really want to roll out Juwan Jennings as a starter. So, um, like, I think he's sticking around realistically, but is there a place that would elevate him to, to near first round consideration? I don't really think so. What's interesting with Ayuk is he's another guy who ECR and ADP are very different. Uh, Ayuk's his ADP is wide receiver fifteen. Um, he's twenty seventh overall. ECR he's he's eighteenth overall wide receiver eleven. So um, he's closer to that top twelve range in the consensus rankings. ADP is not reflecting that. By by the way, guys, um, I, when I put together this list of the ADP, I'm positive I had it right. It appears that as of yesterday, it switched and Taylor is now 12th with Gibbs 13th. <laughs> so order has been you restored. You did it right. You did ADP. it right, Fitzy. We were ahead of the curve just slightly. All, all <laughs> we, my we lobbying bet. paid off. It's good to know. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Um, any other final thoughts in the first round, Bogman? No, I think, you know, I, I if I had to pick a spot, Dallas maybe, uh, because they still don't have a running game. You're not going to get doubled because Lamb is on the other side and Dak is an accurate quarterback. Like that all, it all has to add up right. The reason why he's so good in San Francisco is they have so many weapons. You can't really double Ayuk so he gets open downfield. 
but he had less catches. He had fewer targets than AJ Brown had catches last season. So yeah. I just don't think that those numbers are really sustainable for that success outside of San Francisco in many spots. Maybe like Fitz said, Washington, Dallas is another good one. Not many spots that he could go to improve the stock though. All right, I think we've hit on all the names that are at least worth hitting on. So we'll get out of there on that. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in this week. Hopefully this helps you wherever you're picking in the first round. Bogman, go get back to your college football game. For, for Bogs and Fitz, I'm Ryan Wormley. We'll see everybody again next time.